Hello, welcome to another lens test episode with the Media Division. Today, we're going to test the brand new ProTube lenses from Laowa. And we have one filming me right now. These are the successors of the original probe lens by uh, Laowa, which is quite a legend by now. So we're going to test what you can really do with this and how much better it actually is. And we got some help with this from the Marmalade, which is going to help us to make some really awesome stuff here on a motion control system spike. The new Laowa Pro Tubes put the Pro in Probe. Plural, as it offers three lenses with different shooting angles, making DIY mirror setups a thing of the past. But even more importantly, they offer a much faster pressure of T8, making the Pro Tubes twice as fast as the original probe lens. A team from the Marmonade in the Media Division will conduct a test with a series of cinematic experiments that expose the possibilities and the quality of these lenses, as well as giving you some interesting background information and education in filmmaking, just to steer your creative juices and to make it as fun as possible. We're going to create a mini to macro shoot, explore a technique called dry for wet for a mysterious underwater shoot, and wild fluid dynamics in a tank. What do the lower ProTube lenses bring to the table and how much does it mitigate the original probe's Achilles heel, that is, the hunger for light? Talking about ungodly amounts of light. Let's put the OP in Oppenheimer. Fire the hole! This is the Laowa ProTube set of three lenses. The set comes in a case. The build quality looks very good. The ProTubes are gigantic in comparison to the old probe, almost like the original probe lens grew up into something a bit more sophisticated. That means more speed with a T8, more reach and reduced working distance. Three tube lenses allow for three different shooting angles, direct view or zero degrees, the upgrade to the original probe, 35 degrees for high and low angle shots without the need to tilt the camera. And 90 degrees, a full on periscope to look over, under and around corners. The rotation of the 35 and the 90 degree lenses can be adjusted by loosening some screws on the socket. Focal length is 24mm with a 2x image magnification for all three lenses, just like the original probe. Transmission aperture is T8, so measured transmission speed. That corresponds to a f7.7, almost twice as fast as the original. The minimum aperture is still T40. The minimum working distance is much improved with 4mm compared to the original's 20mm. That can be quite a big deal. Laowa claims a professional center housing, full manual operation, hard stops and a 150 degrees focus throw that operates nice and smoothly. Mount options are PL, F, RF, Z, FE and L. We have the PL version here. The ProTubes lost the LED ring light that is on the barrel of the original probe. I wonder if that was due to space restrictions. All lenses weighed a tad bit over 1 kilogram and cost around $3,000 each or $8,500 as a lens set, like the one we have here. Quite a bit more than the original, but about the same as the Perry Probe. Full disclaimer, Laowa gave us the lenses for free before the official launch, so we can tell them and you what we think about them. Nonetheless, we will give you and Laowa our unfiltered opinion based on our tests and experience. That is of course limited as we only had them for three weeks. Probe lenses have been around for ages and the gold standard of professional probe lenses might be the modular Optec Excellence 35mm probe and periscope system. It is rare and out of production, so you can't really buy them. Rentals are between $1,000 and $2,000, that is, per day. Laowa brought probe lenses into a more accessible price range and therefore into widespread usage. The Laowa 24mm probe was and is one of the very few lenses that we are aware of 
that is used and endorsed by hobby photographers, prosumers, cinematographers and high-end VFX specialists alike. It is just that versatile and relatively cheap. The probe's snorkel allows otherwise impossible shooting situation, including being submerged in fluids. It keeps the camera itself out of harm's way and it's less scary for tiny wildlife, allowing for a more intimate relation between the subject and the audience. If you have been around on our channel, you probably have noticed shots and whole projects that have been realized using the lower probe, like our short GLOW. Or parts of the Intro to Scope, our series about anamorphic lenses, where we fly into the projector using an anamorphic lens, but switch halfway to the lower probe that allows us to get closer. And by disassembling the projector lens and repeating the same move with motion control, to fly right through the lens into the projector. The box view that the lower probe offers makes it ideal to transport the audience into a toy world, like this one using Playmobil. Or here recreating a stadium atmosphere with tip kick. All you need for this is a TV, a slider and, of course, a probe lens. This reveals another quality that is unique to probe lenses. Shots like this require the camera to be extremely close to the surface of the table, bench or the floor. Professional cameras and lenses are too big to get that close. If your project mandates pristine images, probe lenses are your best option. All that sounds amazing, so besides portability, why are not all lenses probe lenses? The narrow snorkel of a probe lens demands a tiny entrance pupil, making the lower probe a ridiculously slow T14 lens. Like with the miniature and projector shots we showed you earlier, you can easily compensate by simply using longer exposure times or use environments and subjects that are naturally bright. But if you require real-life motion in a studio setup, get ready to have bright lights in close proximity. Now. If you do ultra-slow motion in a large set, you need Oppenheimer grade lighting. Having been on some sets where the Marmalade used the original probe on high-speed robotic motion control shots, well, see for yourself. Sometimes it feels like you're right inside Poltergeist. Listen to me! Do not go into the light! So, from prosumer to high-end, what we need is speed. Enter the lower 24mm ProTube. With a maximum aperture of T8, it cuts the light requirement in half. Almost. If you shoot wide open, of course. And there are plenty of reasons not to when you're in the macro realm. Before we have some fun recreating iconic underwater cinematography without getting wet, and some fluid shots getting wet, we do our homework and compare the ProTube at different T-stops and look at the improvement of the original probe. Our test setup features a classic Volkswagen Beetle. Lighting and a little bit of love, let it shine. We use a big bounce from above to let the paint job look beautiful. For a rear gig it would have to be much bigger, but for this test it has to do. We want to frame the real Beetle and move to an exactly identical framing on a miniature of the same Beetle. The Marmalade Spike Motion Control System allows us to do a complex shot that we can also repeat over and over to show different T-stops and comparison to the old probe lens as well as a non-probe lens, side by side. This is not only complex for the move itself, but also for the focus. For this test, we are going to use the straight pole tube variant on a full-frame Cinecam, providing a wide field of view. Given the proximity to the miniature for the end frame, a probe lens has the benefit that the camera, cage and the lens itself don't collide with the car or cast shadows on the miniature. A longer focal length macro could do that too, but that would create a much less dramatic perspective and therefore inhibit the sense of movement. We shoot this at T16 and 800 ISO.
the smaller a pixel of a sensor is, the earlier diffraction kicks in, something described by the Nyquist limit. With a 6K full-frame sensor at T16, we are already in diffraction territory and the effective resolution is limited by the small entrance pupil of the lens. Diffraction softens the image, progressively with higher F numbers. The more resolution the image has, the sooner this becomes noticeable, not taking the subject matter and viewing distance in account. We are going to repeat the shot with different T-stops to show you the effect of diffraction versus the usual limitations of shooting a lens wide open. This is the ProTube at a maximum T8 aperture that will bring us out of the realm of diffraction. We stay at 800 ISO and compensate with ND. Lighting may vary slightly as the illumination from the large windows varies a bit. Here is a side-by-side -side of the T8 and T16. Of course, we don't benefit from less diffraction simply as the DOF is now so shallow that you look at areas that are out of focus and we get a bit of blooming in other limiting factors. This is the ProTube at T22 and ISO 2000. And this is the ProTube at T40 in ISO 16000. Of course, diffraction and the high ISO and the now required noise reduction limit the image quality severely. We didn't compare the ProTube variants to each other because of time restrictions and an expectation of getting similar to identical results between them. But we are very much interested in comparing the original OA probe to the ProTube. How do they compare in terms of image quality? This is the original probe at the maximum T14 aperture at ISO 800. Here is the side-by-side -side of the ProTube and the original probe at T16. The difference in perspective is due to the different length of the tubes and therefore the entrance pupil. We see that the original probe has a noticeable warmer image. Looking at the details, we also see that the ProTube shows more detail and less blooming at T14, as you would expect from a faster but slightly stopped down lens. This is the original probe at T22 and ISO 2000. And this is the original probe at T40 and ISO 16000. Now, let's compare the probe lenses to an ordinary cine lens. We're going to use the Sigma 24mm T1.5. This lens is not a macro lens and it would collide with the hood, so we keep a bit of distance to the miniature. And we see that it provides considerable better image quality and something odd. At T8, the Sigma's image is overexposed. It's much brighter than the lowest T8, which shouldn't be the case with T numbers. If there is no need for a probe lens, a normal lens is the better option. We continue with a quick test for the usability. The shot you just saw is a demonstration of several advantages that a probe lens offers. Only a probe lens can fit through the narrow opening of the small window of the beetle. Yeah. Only a yeah. probe lens would offer enough reach to get close to the talent's eyes behind that window. And only a probe lens is small enough to avoid casting significant shadows on the talent's eye. Focus and framing is achieved by moving the head on direction. On action, the probe is quickly pulled out of the window and moved to the end position to frame a wide shot. We get the shot even more dramatic by zooming into the pupil by cropping into the image in post. The ProTube played along well and we were able to execute our concept without any problems. Motion control really helped with a shot like this, but you could do this with a normal dolly or even a steady cam. The 150-degree focus throw 
is way too short to be precise in something like this. We generally recommend to use a motorized focus solution with dynamic protube shots. Let's have some fun now. This is dry for wet. To understand what we are doing, let's do a little excursion into VFX cinematography. Underwater shots in movies always have a certain magic to them. The environment is kind of cinematic in itself. To actually shoot underwater is hard and expensive for obvious reasons. For The Abyss, James Cameron combined miniature shots with full-scale underwater sets in a flooded cooling tower of a nuclear power plant. If you are a sports diver, you might have a glimpse of how hard the production of The Abyss has been, all this in a time where there weren't even LED lights to illuminate your miniatures. Diving is physically demanding for the crew in the cast and there has been reported incidences of near drownings. Nothing of this scale has been attempted since, for good reasons. A different approach to realize underwater scenes is a technique called dry for wet. As the name suggests, one doesn't shoot submerged, but in a haste studio, allowing the crew and equipment to stay dry. This makes it possible to use motion control systems and other things that are not feasible underwater, not to mention production cost and safety. Movies like The Hunt for Red October and Crimson Tide use this technique extensively. Things like bubbles in the water are added with CGI. In case of Crimson Tide, dry for wet is supported by wet for wet shots when fluid dynamics are important, like here when a sub implodes. A lot of modern movies use dry for wet for practical reasons, but also for a surreal look like here in the shape of water. Projectors are used to create the caustics of shallow water. A lot of overcranking and added CGI elements are used to enhance the illusion. Things like floating hair and gills are added in post. Act opposite of dry for wet, so wet for dry, was common for VFX work. The demon dog in Poltergeist was realized using a one meter tall puppet submerged in a transparent water tank against a black backdrop. The image was then superimposed on the sequence with the actress for an extra ghostly effect. In 300 we see a woman in trance. Again she was filmed in a water tank. Speed ramps are added in post. Also, unavoidable bubbles were removed with the help of CG. One of my favorite movies and the one movie I recommend when I'm asked for the best German movie is 1981's Das Boot. Das Boot or The Boat is an anti-war movie based on a true story. Set in World War II, it follows the crew of the submarine U-96 on a fine fart. It provides a deep insight into the hardship and the moral dilemmas that sailors were exposed to. But we are more about the technical aspects here. The movie used different scale submarine models for different shots, including a full-size one that was towed for scenes like the departure from La Rochelle. Fun fact, when you see the submarine in Indiana Jones' Raiders of the Lost Ark, that is the U-96 built for Dust Boat. Steven Spielberg borrowed the full-size model from the Dust Boat production. Underwater exteriors for Dust Boat were shot wet for wet. The late Wolfgang Petersen is on record stating the difficulties with the process. The film begins with an iconic shot of U-96 appearing from the mist of the Atlantic Ocean. This shot works extremely well with the wonderful soundtrack, which I can't use here, sadly. The model was only 2 to 3 meter long and Peterson wanted the camera to dive underneath it for an extended view of the boat, little like the Star Destroyer in the beginning of A New Hope. After six weeks of shooting and over 50 attempts, this was the best they could get. And it totally works, but still, it didn't match the vision that Peterson had. As a homage, we will try to recreate the shot with a long dive under the submarine using the dry for wet technique, spike and the protubes. Dry for wet requires a lot of haze. For practical reasons, we set up a smaller tent inside the studio. This will allow better control about the density of the haze, lighting and keep the crew out of harm's way. 
I got the largest U96 model I could find. It is 1 to 48 scale and about 1 meter 40 long. To simulate a sky above the far away surface, a strong LED panel is bounced into the roof. For the shot we want to recreate, the lens has to fly extremely close to the hull, which would also get in the way of the camera cage and the robot arm itself. The 90 degree periscope protube is a great option in this scenario. Now it's time to haze the room. We opted for a more natural blue water instead of the strong green hue of the original. As a rule of thumb, the thicker the haze is, the deeper the scene appears to be. After a while, the tent becomes a real hellhole with visibility under a meter. A strange and very disorientating place to work in. But on camera, it looks absolutely magical. Niklas programs Spike to execute a perfect dolly move, revealing more and more of the boat by tilting upwards towards the end. I really hope that Wolfgang Petersen would have approved and liked a little homage. Let's do a little critique of maneuver. We make mistakes so you don't have to. There is no shooting that is flawless unless you have really tested and exercised the specifics, which of course we can't, given that this is a test without a budget. We had to fight vibrations caused by the free-floating roof of our tent, but with patience and some tricks we were able to overcome the usual hurdles. All but one issue that we missed for the majority of the shoot. The vents of the Marvel F that we used on Spike pressed the haze in between the sensor and the OLPF, a space that must be hermetically sealed to avoid accumulation of dust and dirt. Residue quickly started to build up on multiple surfaces within this critical space causing patterns and artifacts in the image, basically ruining the shot. The problem remained hidden so long as it's common to see sensor dirt at high f-stops and the problem worsened slowly. This is why we only got the intro shot with acceptable artifacts and patterns and they're still quite visible. Both cameras that we used for b-roll, namely the Panasonic BS1H and the S52X have vents too and were running in the same environment without showing similar effects. Sometimes you do have to live with things and do what you can in post. Still, I would like you to see what else we shot. We program another camera move, recreating this scene from The Hunt for Red October. A move that is actually quite complex, but not too complex for Niklas and Spike. For this, we utilize the 35 degrees protube lens, as it's the easiest to maneuver around the rudder. After that we did a perspective from the side. Both shots suffer badly from the haze artifacts I explained, progressively worse on the side perspective. Please overlook that. The water bomb that you saw at the end of the sequence is a practical effect that we shot with paint in a tank. And Max altered that in post to look more like an explosion using speed ramps and grading. Awesome job Max, thank you for that. Let us show you how we did that in our next chapter about flutes. 
if there was a world championship in shooting fluids, the Marmalade would be right up there having done some serious work using spike with probe lenses and large tanks with incredible results. So what we are doing here is child's play for them. Keep in mind that it's not a paid gig but a lens test and we want to see how the pro tubes do underwater for you and ourselves. We started off doing some colors to get warm and finding interesting angles using the different protube variants. We wanted to evaluate the difference between a submerged shot, like this one using the 90 degree version, or putting the lens on the surface of the glass like we did here using the 35 degrees. As we are sure that you have seen fluid dynamics before, we started to develop ideas as we went along. Because of our dry for wet theme, we started to play around with the idea to simulate a death charge explosion using fluids and light. Using a Phantom VEO 4K will give us the high frame rates that will make the explosion look like it was on a much larger scale. We didn't use firecrackers or other explosives as underwater shock waves are very potent due to the high water density. The force could potentially destroy our tanks that are not enforced for such usage. Our bomb is a balloon filled with paint. Pressing the balloon underwater and pricking it releases a ball-shaped fluid that mimics an explosion. Additional clouds are added by pushing water jets through the paintball. We will combine that with a real explosion in post. The SFX team of the Marmalade had awesome tricks up their sleeves. At times, we had a full-on thunderstorms of light around our tank. This should mimic light reflections from other depth charges going off in the area. The main light was a 30,000 watt lab light that fires 2 to 20 seconds. The same light was used in Oppenheimer and it was the same light that gave me a 2 second deep sun tanning at the beginning of this episode. The key to a great shot is timing and perfect timing can require you to reset the shooting environment over and over and over again and as you will have to empty out and refill the tank each and every time, working with fluids can be very time consuming. Our fluid session took over twice as long as our dry for wet session. The longer tubes of the pro tubes and the different angles allow for improved handling and more possibilities, submerged or not. It is much simpler to keep the camera dry, especially if it's a Phantom V of 4K that is slightly out of my budget. After putting the ProTube lenses through all our sessions, it is time for a verdict. In very short, the ProTubes do everything that the O-Probe did, just better. Of course, you usually don't shoot at T8 when you're very close to your subject. The depth of field just gets very, very narrow. But still, it's great to have the T8 as an option. At T14, the ProTube would deliver a more detailed and, let's say, more polished look than the original probe can give you at T14. Something especially important in tabletop situations, but even beyond that. The color reproduction is much more neutral and barrel distortions is reduced a bit. There is little to complain about the protubes. For the main use case of these lenses, the 150 degrees focus throw is a bit short. We would have appreciated a much longer focus throw. Of course, that is an easy fix by using a motorized focus solution and you can do that on the cheap with something like a Tilde Nano. The rotation of the lenses is a bit cumbersome having to unscrew tiny screws. We would have loved something that works quick and toolless. The case the lenses came in could be sturdier, it was already damaged on arrival. Something more protective and watertight like a Pele case would have been the better choice for a lens set in this class. Where could Laowa go with the protubes from here? The 85 degree field of view is great, but you always need a lot of set to fill that view. Longer focal length with a smaller field of view would be handy. We would have loved to have a free angle like you have with the Optex probe. All that with a modular approach would make for a great addition to a great system. Are the protubes worth their water? That really depends on what you're trying to achieve and what your budget is. If you already own an original probe and you don't depend on it regularly, well, only you can decide what value the improvements have for you. For professional FX specialists and tabletop work, it is heaven sent and worth every penny. A big thanks go out to Laowa for providing the lenses for this test. An even bigger thanks and our hearts go out to the Marmalade and the awesome team that put together the test sessions. 
It is always like being in the chocolate factory for filmmakers to work with the equipment, the studio and the skilled professionals that they are. Very special thanks to the whole team behind this episode. Special thanks go to Christopher Klemme for his massive input, organization and spirit on set. Another special thank you goes out to Niklas Eichen for operating the Marmalade's own robotic motion control system Spike. Most of our shots would have been impossible without Spike and his fearless handler. A big thank you to all our members for their ongoing support. Without you, the Media Division project wouldn't be possible. Our next epic episode is in the making. Your lector for cinematography is on the loose to do research. Subscribe and hit notifications if you don't want to miss that one. And you can always follow us on Instagram if you want to know what we are cooking. Link is in the description. Until then, why don't you watch one of our epic episodes like F0.3 where we create an impossible image. Or F0.7 about ultra-fast lenses and Kubrick's mysterious moon lens. Or Canon FD episode revisiting aliens. And if you want to learn everything about anamorphic lenses, we follow Blade Runner in our epic scope series. This is it for today. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you had as much fun as we had. Until next time, I say thank you to the Marmalade and to you, shoot something amazing. Bye.